Happy for no reason means you have an inner state of peace and well-being that doesn't depend on your circumstances. Yes. So stuff happens. People die. You're going to feel grief. You know, something upsets you. You might feel upset or angry. But behind that, there is this backdrop of peace and well-being that you carry with you wherever you go so that you, you're more resilient, you're more creative. You know, the way I look at it is instead of trying to extract your happiness from your life experiences, which is what most people try to do, yes, is we bring our happiness to our life experiences. Yes, It's an entirely different come from. Peace and riches, blessings. I am Michael B. Beck with the host of Take Back Your Mind. heard me say for many years, peace and radical blessings. Peace is the dynamic of harmonizing good. That's what peace is. It's a quality all of its own. Peace and blessings. Blessings is a conferring of life, of more life. When someone says, bless you, they're saying they're conferring more of the beauty of life upon your soul. So I say peace and radical blessings. Peace and mighty blessings. Peace and blessings. And welcome to Take Back Your Mind, the podcast that is about having agency over our own awareness. The life question of the week comes from Louise. She says, I have a clear vision of what I want my life to look like, a life dedicated to meditation, creative writing, and nature study. But I find myself perpetually stuck in the tool gathering place and feel frozen when it comes to actually putting this life into motion and engaging these practices. I feel as if I am behind a glass wall and can't move into living my life. How can I break through this stuck energy and move into living and being my vision? You said you're in the, thank you for the question first of all, Louise, you're in the tool gathering place and you can't get out of it. They used to call that paralysis by analysis. You keep become paralyzed because you keep analyzing and you keep gathering tools, you keep studying, you keep you become paralysis by analysis. I used to say that it's called um, a, a, a spiritual constipation where you gather so much information, but you don't use it, so you become constipated. This is what you're describing. It's also called inertia. You can't move. This is what you do. And you, you, you hold fast to your vision, to the life you want to live, the, the gifts you want to share, the talents you want to express. You hold fast to the vision, but you do little tiny steps. You don't try to do everything at once. I'm going to go write. I'm going to go meditate. I'm going to do all of these things. I see my... No, no. You just take one thing at a time. And if you take a baby step every single day, then that baby step helps you move from inertia to momentum. And once momentum happens in your life, then you discover that you're able to pick up doing other things in your life, moving from inertia to momentum. Now, everyone is the same. The only thing that separates us is our habits. So if you develop a habit of doing a small step every day, That will become your way of living. You'll create a great degree of momentum. And then you'll discover what is called spontaneous goodness. Your momentum will become the condition for spontaneous goodness to break into your life. And because it has become habitual, the little things, the tiny things, you'll look back and you'll realize that you have done a lot of things that amount to something big. So... Why don't you begin in the morning by being grateful and sitting for a couple of moments in meditation? Why don't you continue with just a couple of moments of creative writing in your journal without any judgment on what you're writing? Going out in your backyard, 
and looking at the trees and being grateful for the flowers and trees. If you don't have a backyard, go to the front yard. If you don't have a backyard or a front yard, look at the sky and see the clouds. Start with something small. Do something every single day until momentum takes over and you discover this spaciousness within you to do more. And your constipation by taking in so much information that's not being used will be transmuted and you'll start to digest the information that you've received. It'll become the bone of your bone, the blood of your blood. And you'll find that you've changed. And you know what will happen then? The life that you're holding for yourself will begin to emerge and it will be better than what you're holding in your imagination. Again, peace and blessings, Louise, and everyone that benefited from your question. Have a bright day. Just a moment, I'll be with my friend, Marcy Shymoff, and she's gonna bring forth happiness for no reason. Blessings. Peace and blessings, everyone. Life is amazing. Life is meant to be good and life is good because life is alive with itself, teeming with itself, wanting to know itself more and more as each and every one of us. So this particular podcast, Take Back Your Mind, is, is about having agency over our own awareness that we can make choices from an expanded awareness, activate our gifts, talents, and capacity to have more life flow through us, and make a mighty difference on the planet. I have with me today, Marcy, Marcy Shymoff, number one New York Times bestselling author, a re world-renowned transformational leader, teacher, expert on happiness, success, and unconditional love. Her books include runaway bestsellers, happy for no reason, love for no reason, six titles, and the phenomenally successful Chicken Soup of the Woman's Soul series. Her books have sold more than 16 million copies worldwide in 33 languages, have topped off all of the major best-selling lists, and have been on the New York Times best-selling list for a total of 121 weeks. She's one of the best-selling female nonfiction authors of all time. She's the host of the national PBS television special called Happy for No Reason, is a feature teacher in The Secret, and is the narrator of the award-winning film Happy. She, cur she currently co-leads a worldwide program called Your Year of Miracles with thousands of participants from 72 countries. I've been honored to be a part of that dynamic program. She's inspired millions of people around the world and is dedicated to helping people live more miraculous, empowered, and joy-filled lives. We've known each other for years. She's a colleague. She's a friend. This is Mar Marcy Shy Moth, and she's not shy about her happiness. Hey, Marcy, how you doing? I'm so great. That's always fat. I'm happy for great reason to get to be here with you, Michael. You are, whenever I'm with you, it's a love fest. So I'm, I'm looking forward to the love fest. That's just yeah. how you do life. That's how we do life. And you and you look so good. I was just commenting earlier, you know, you're bright, you're beautiful, the flowers, the tree of life behind you, happy mm -hmm. for no reason, boogie. Everything is just curated so wonderfully. Thank you. I'm, I I love I love variety. Yeah. Well, listen, uh, as, as we as we begin our conversation for the 16 people that may not know who you are, <laughs> would, you, would you just kind of give us a little bit of your your backstory and, sure. you know, how you became this beautiful being that's spreading light and love and happiness and touching so many beautiful people around the world. I mean, who was Marcy before mm -hmm. and what happened? Yeah. Came this beautiful being that I know. Well, Michael, I am one of the least likely people on the planet to be speaking and teaching about happiness and, and miracles. I was born depressed. Mm -hmm. I came out of the womb with existential angst. Mm. I, uh, I had a great family and great circumstances. And I just had this sort of dark cloud around me. I was, I was depressed. I think now when looking back, I think I had some ancestral trauma. Yeah. Um, but I, my solution as a kid to being depressed was something called sugar. 
I became a sugar addict as a young kid. And um, I, that didn't help, you know, you'd be happy for a minute and then, then more depressed. By the time I was in high school, I was about 35 pounds overweight. Wow. So when I got to be in my 20s, I did what I think a lot of people do. I set goals for myself. And I figured that once I reach these goals, that's it. I'll have it. I'll be happy. And I'm going to share with you. I had five goals. I want to just share them with you because I think that you'll be able to relate to some of these. I think a lot of people can relate. I wanted to have a great career, successful career helping people. I wanted to have a wonderful husband or life partner. I wanted a uh, fabulous friends, a comfortable home, and the equivalent of Halle Berry's body. <laughs> Look out now. <laughs> so I worked really hard to get all those ducks in a row, and I got four out of the five. I don't have Halle Berry's body. <laughs> but I got a healthy body, so that worked. You know, I, I really, you know, Michael, I think so many people, they're working really, really hard thinking that thing, just that next thing is going to do it. And I had a turning point moment. And my turning point moment was in 1998, I had, a, I had three books in the top five on the New York Times bestseller list at the same time. Mm -hmm. And I had just given a speech to 8,000 people. And mm -hmm. I had autographed 5,432 books. They were counting. Mm. My client had a massage therapist there massaging my hand so I could keep on signing. And on one hand, and I know you know this feeling, on one hand, I felt like an author rock star. Mm-hmm. But I remember after signing that last book, Michael, I went up to my hotel room. The client had gotten me the penthouse suite that was in Chicago. And I went over to these huge windows overlooking Lake Michigan. And I took in the view and I turned around and collapsed onto the bed and burst into tears. And I, I burst into tears because I realized I had what I thought I needed. And I still felt that emptiness in my heart that I had felt my whole life. And mm. I couldn't fool myself into thinking that just that next thing was gonna do it because I'd been there, I knew that, it's not gonna work. Right. And that's when I dove headfirst into studying happiness. And I interviewed a hundred what I call unconditionally happy people. You are one of them, Michael. And I, I did all the I research on happiness and, and I started doing whatever he was telling me to do and it worked. Wow. So that's why I'm here. Now, it's interesting because many people have come through levels of darkness mm. or some kind of thing they had to overcome, but it seems as though that was their school. You know, it's like they needed to go through that. And you may be one of them that needed to go through that, that sense of depression, that sense of the dark cloud over you. It was like maybe it may have been ancestral, but you may have been, you may have set yourself up on a soul level to learn something in order to bring to, to, to the race. What do, you, what do you think about that? I absolutely believe that. I believe it was my soul contract. Yeah. You know, I believe that I, uh, my purpose here, when I was 13, I went to see my, a, a friend of mine's parents brought me to see a motivational speaker, Zig Ziglar. Remember oh, Zig? Yeah, 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 yeah. Back in, the, he was about one of the only ones. It was 1971. Yeah. For those, for those of you who are doing quick math, you don't have to do it, I'm 65. And um, so I went and saw Zig and I, I knew that's what I was supposed to do. I knew that I was supposed to inspire people. And I, uh, I went home and told my parents, they weren't very excited about it because they'd never heard of a <laughs> oh, professional How are you gonna make speaker. money inspiring people? <laughs> totally. My dad was a dentist. They wanted me to be a dental hygienist. But then my mom said, honey, you, you sure talk enough. You might as well get paid for it. <laughs> so anyway, I, I really believe that my life has been about learning what what I need to learn about happiness, what I need to learn about living a more miraculous life, what I'm here to learn about love so that I can tell people from a really real place, hey, this this is what I've done and it works. And, um, you know, I think that, I mean, you have the same kind of thing. You, your story, which you have so many stories, but your story is just an amazing story. And thank God you went through those dark nights that you went through. Absolutely. And no, no one really escapes the dark night of the soul no. at, at some point, whatever, everyone has their different version of it. But it brings you to that point where your identity changes. You literally, your brain waves change, your identity changes. Everything you've identified with before as who you were changes and you become 
uh, essentially an expression of what you're meant to be, not what society tells you you're supposed to be, not what your parents thought you should be, not what the government thinks you should be, but your identity shifts and you come through it and you become yourself. Yes. You know, and, and as you write, you know, for no reason, you're happy. You don't have to have a reason anymore. Now, now the book you wrote, Happy for No Reason, where in your uh, development did you write that one? So about the time I I started really recognizing that- Seven this, steps. The, it was like seven steps. Yeah, seven steps. Yeah. I realized the next shiny thing isn't going to do it for me. So I started researching and interviewing people like you and interviewing the scientists and starting to do these things and that I was learning. And I would say I went from about a D in happiness, if you were giving me a grade, mm -hmm. to an A. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm still a work in progress, but it's a solid A. And I, I thought, man, this is not, this doesn't, this isn't going to work just for me. So that's when I started writing this and, and testing this out on people. I, one of the first people I tested it out on was my mother. Mm. Uh, my mom, she was in her 80s at the time, and she had never been happy. She just, mm. and I think she biochemically just didn't have the, the right biochemistry for happiness, which is one of the seven ingredients that we can talk about. But I, I remember I, I had her start doing the things I was learning. And she became a different person. Mm, like like you just old. said, she yeah. just moved from that sort of shrunken, contracted ego self into her true soulful self. And it was incredible. I, at one time, she was 87 and she had to have an emergency surgery, this really long surgery. And, and we weren't sure she would come through. And when she was done, she woke up i was standing over her and there were tubes coming out of everywhere and i said mom how are you doing mm. she looked up to me with a big smile she said honey i'm happy for no reason <laughs> oh you know, yeah you got it I, you know? I remember we were at a transformational leadership council i mean i just finished speaking and you came running up to me you were so excited and you were saying something like happy for no reason says you covered so much material in that talk. Happy for no reason. Happy for no reason. I didn't understand. <laughs> you were so excited. <laughs> she said, I'm writing books on happy for no reason. <laughs> I'll always remember that look on your face. And I said, what is she talking about? And then, you know, now I look at your career. You know, you're like, you're like the happy person. You're the poster child for, for the miraculous life and happy for no reason. Now, what, what would you say? Okay, there's seven steps. Let's, let me just go through that first. Yeah. What, it's, it's, yeah. I want well, to go through that first. Well, right. I'd love to. And first, let me just share with you what I mean by happy for no reason. Yes. Because I don't mean that you're walking around 24-7 with a grin on your face and you're, right. you're in some la-la state of denial. Happy for no reason means you have an inner state of peace and well-being that doesn't depend on your circumstances. Yes. So stuff happens. People die. You're going to feel grief. You know, something upsets you. You might feel upset or angry, but behind that, there is this backdrop of peace and well-being that you carry with you wherever you go so that you, you're more resilient, you're more creative. You know, the way I look at it is instead of trying to extract your happiness from your life experiences, which is what most people try to do, yes, is we bring our happiness to our life experiences. Yes, It's an entirely different come from. Yes. You're, just, you're describing freedom. You're totally. describing spiritual liberation because, as you say, most people are getting their happiness if it, if, it, if a circumstance is exactly the way they want it, or a condition, or a situation. And if it's not, their happiness disappears. That's what we call pseudo happiness. It's based on external changes or external circumstances. But you're describing freedom to be able to be in that space of happiness, regardless of an external circumstances. And as you said. Does it mean sadness is not going to pass through? Does it mean grief is not going to pass through? Does it mean disappointment is not going to pass through? But it, but it's it's the, the, it's in the context of your larger field of of happiness and joy, and I think that message is extremely important during this time in human history, where uh, anxiety and worry, anxiousness have become normalized in our society. 
because conditions are volatile. That, that message about happiness for no reason is probably more important than any other time in history. And you're, 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 you're definitely bringing it. I appreciate that. Yeah, well, you know, it's so much of our, the way we've been raised and the way that society is sharing with us, it is so externally focused. Yeah. And, you know, so that's, it's natural that we think, oh, it's going to come from, I've got to get it out there. But it's such an, uh, it's such a, a flimsy place to get your happiness because yeah, I call it happy for good reason. Yes. You know, there's nothing wrong with having fabulous things or a wonderful partner or whatever. But what happens when that goes away, if you're basing your happiness on it, it's, it, that's never really going to be what we want. We want lasting. We want the real deal. And I agree with you. It's freedom. It's absolutely freedom. So what are, what are the seven, what you call them, uh, seven steps? Seven steps. So I, when I did the research, I found that the only difference between happy people and everybody else is that they have different habits. Mm -hmm. the, the only thing, I mean, the research shows that we each have a happiness set point. Yes. And no matter what happens, good or bad, we're going to return to that unless we change our set point. Yes. And the biggest part of the set point we can change is our habits. Yes. So. I found there are 21 main happiness habits. They fall into these seven areas. It's hard for people to remember seven of anything. So I created an analogy. It's called building your inner home for happiness. Mm -hmm. So a home has seven areas. It's got a foundation, four corner pillars, a roof, and a garden. And here's how this relates to happiness. Your foundation is taking responsibility for your life. Yes. It's showing up in life as a victor rather than a victim, you mm -hmm. know, and we know we're the victim when we're in blame, shame, or complaining. Yes. So bottom line, got to start there. Then there's the pillar of the mind, our thoughts, you know, a lot of what you're talking about here, taking back the mind, yes. what is your mind doing to either support your freedom and happiness, or what is it doing to, to take it away? Then there's the pillar of the heart. I have never met a happy person who had a closed heart. Mm. Never. You know, happy people genuinely are open hearted. They're kind. They're generous. They're easy to forgive. You know, mm. all of those beautiful qualities of open heartedness. Yes. Then there is the pillar of the body, the biochemistry. You know, do you have enough endorphins and serotonin and oxytocin and dopamine? Mm -hmm. And by the way, as I go through these, I highly recommend that everybody think, which am I the weakest in? Because wherever you're the weakest, that's your Achilles heel. So Michael, I'm going to ask you at the end of this, which are you the weakest in? You're going to be mm -hmm. my guinea pig here. Okay. Then there's the pillar of the soul. And mm -hmm. the pillar of the soul is how connected do you feel to the greater energy of life, which whatever you call it, God, divine. And by the way, Michael, this is this was the chapter that I had your story in was the pillar of the soul because you mm. are an amazing embodiment of truly um, living, you know, from the soul. Mm. And mm. then there is the roof of your home for happiness, and the roof is your purpose or passion in life. Are you living mm -hmm. an inspired life? And then finally, there's the garden, and that's who do you surround yourself with? Do you have a lot of roses and gardenias? The people who who inspire you? Do you have mm -hmm. some weeds, some, some, some toxicity or things that bring you down in your garden? Right. So those are the seven areas. And Michael, I think you're strong probably in all of them, but where, if you go weak in one of those areas, where, where would that be most likely for you? You, you tell me, I'll tell you, um, every area you went through, I'm, I'm feel really strong in those areas. Um, but I, I think that for me, I have, um, I, even after all these years, I still have like a, a, a kind of a critic within me about myself. Mm -hmm. Much better than it was 20 years ago, 10 years ago, five years ago. But it's still there. I, I have a, a critic that I can always um, do more, give more, share more, be more. But I, I got faced with that the last couple of weeks. And the inner voice just told me to relax. You're doing all right. You, you, you're making an impact on the world, you're, you're healthy, and you're happy, you know, so the, it, 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 the inner voice told me to calm that, not to pay too much attention to that critic, but that would be the area that I'm, I'm, I'm kind of growing in. That's my growing so, edge, I would say. I, thank you for sharing that, 
you mm-hmm. know i i think that that it's inspiring it's inspiring for me to hear that you who really have spent so much of your life with this that that's where that can still come up occasionally yeah. and what i found is that's the area that's the hardest for most people mm-hmm. the mind you know 80% of the average person's thoughts are negative mm-hmm. we inherited this tendency it's called the negativity bias from our <laughs> I speak about answers. that a lot. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. it's so it's we don't want to beat ourselves up for that. <laughs> you Absolutely. know, it's like, let's add insult to injury there. And a, a, a dear friend of mine, Rick Hansen, who wrote a book called Hardwiring Happiness, he's a, a neuroscientist. He he says our minds are like Velcro for the negative. They stick to us, but they're like Teflon for the positive. The positive just slides off of us. And what I've seen is that happy people reverse that tendency. Yes. Where they, you know, most people, if you get 10 compliments in a day and one criticism, what do you remember at the end of the day? They, you remember the criticism. They remember the criticism, sure. And so it's it's this constant, it, it's like what you're saying. You learned to, it's it still shows up. It's an old habit. It still shows up. But you learn not to pay attention to it as much. Absolutely. So, I, so I put a little cancel on it. <laughs> is that how you do it? Yes, they cancel. Cancel. And I think you've also built up enough of the neural pathways in the brain for the positive. You, oh, absolutely. You, that that's why it's easier to just go cancel and not listen to it as much. Absolutely. My my I mean like you, I'm just I'm in joy most of the time. It's just mm. and, and for no reason. It's just and I'm in gratitude for for I mean gratitude is what is where I wake up in the morning. I'm just grateful for no reason. I'm just grateful to be alive. Yeah. And then in that vibration of gratitude, grace and the miraculous and spontaneous goodness shows up in that gratitude. And gratitude also keeps you humble. You don't take, um, you, you, don't, you don't allow vanity to come in and, and take personal credit for things. It's just, you just feel, for me, I feel everything is, is a gift from life. And yeah. so I'm just grateful, I'm thankful. And 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 I, I'm grateful for challenges because I know the challenge is about to birth a, a, a talent, a gift within me that's latent and the challenge is going to bring it forward. So I think gratitude then leads to a, a wider uh, dynamic of happiness and intrinsic joy. And then uh, every now and then if you're like, hmm, you could have done that better. <laughs> but, but that's not that's not my dominant thought. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah. Just, and I- I loved your bringing up gratitude because yeah. when people ask me what's the fast track to happiness, if I had to pick one thing, yeah. that's the one thing I would pick is gratitude. And I, I, uh, I talk about it as radical gratitude, yes. which is like what you just said. It's it's gratitude for just life, gratitude yeah. for what is easy to be grateful for. It's also gratitude for the future, what's coming. Yes. But where it becomes radical is that it's gratitude for what you don't think you want. Yes. It's gratitude for the yucky stuff too. Yes. Yes. And that's that's radical gratitude. Yes. So so people are facing a lot of challenges these days. Yeah. You know, so how do what do you say to people to either attain or maintain happiness during the challenge? I know gratitude is one of them. Yeah. What what, so, what else would you give them? So one of the things, super easy, um, that is scientifically based, is to work on creating new neural pathways in the brain for the positive. Mm -hmm. And there's three steps that I suggest for this. And the first one is to be on the lookout for the good. Okay. Uh, I have one of the women that I interviewed in Happy for No Reason pretends that she's the Academy Awards Committee. Ah. And her job every day is to give out five Academy Awards. So she is just looking for where she can give out an Academy Award. She sees a cute little fluffy white dog walking in this down the street and she goes, oh, that gets my cutest dog of the day award. Or she sees an act of kindness and that gets my act of kindness award. Mm-hmm. So um, just to, you know, and if you've got kids, play this game with your kids. Mm. What are five Academy Awards that I can give out today? And just mm. be, be on the lookout. So that's the first step. And then Let's the stop second right step. there because what's going on is the mind is starting to develop a habit to look for the good. Right. It's a whole nother habitual pattern. Yeah. Right. That's beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. 
And then the second step is to savor it. The science uh, tells us that it actually takes 20 seconds for the good to register enough to cr start creating new neural pathway. Mm -hmm. It doesn't take anywhere near that long for the negatives because they're already mm -hmm. so strongly built in. Mm -hmm. So that means that you need to take 20 seconds to actually savor what it is you're, you're appreciating. Mm. If you've got a sunset, you can't just go, that's a pretty sunset. You gotta look, take it in like you're taking in this. Savor. Savor it. Savor. You know, and that's why if you see the cute dog, you don't just see the dog, you go over to the owner and you go, I give out Academy Awards and your dog gets the cutest dog of the day <laughs> award. You're focusing on that for 20 seconds. Love it. And then the third thing is to go for a three to one ratio, which means you got three positives for every one negative. So anytime that critic comes in, you just say, yeah, I got, I hear you. I, I, I know you're there. And you refocus on the three, on three things that you are appreciating. Mm -hmm. So this is with anything. So if something um, negative flows in your mind, you start to look for three positives immediately. That's right. And so you're living at a three to one. Yeah. That's powerful. I love it. Now, um, you've did all this research. Yeah. What, what, was, what was the most uh, exciting thing for you that you discovered in all yeah. this research? Well, the most exciting thing for me was that idea that we had a happiness set point. Hmm. And set, that no matter yeah. what happens, we're going to go back to the happiness set point. It explains why people think all I have to do is win the lottery. <laughs> and I'll be happy, right? And we know they do. They win the lottery. They're happier for a couple months. About a year it takes for them to go back to their original happiness set point. And by the way, it's the same of people who have tragedies happen. Within about a year, they yeah. return to their original set point. And that scientists found that the set point is, it's made up of three things. It's 10% your circumstances. Mm -hmm. Yet that's what we're all so busy trying to figure out and get right, but it's only 10% of the, the whole pie. It's 50% our DNA, you're born with mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. And it's 40% our habits. Mm -hmm. And and scientists in the field of epigenetics, like our friend, Dr. Bruce Lipton, who wrote The mm -hmm. Biology of Belief, yes, they tell us that, that our genes will change yes. when we change those habits. So that means 90% of our happiness set point, we can change. Hallelujah. That's right. You know, I think that's, that, that is so important because people, I mean, obviously we're living in a nice time of history where the field of epigenetics has emerged and it's kind of matching the metaphysics and the mysticism of the ages that, that whatever you, whatever genes you were born with, whatever DNA you're born with, as you just said, can change. I mean, that's big news for people because people are walking around thinking, well, my auntie, I'm just like my right. aunt Sarah, you know, I'll never be able to change. I'm doomed to this. I'm, and that's, right. that to me was what was so exciting because I thought, okay, I've been depressed my whole life. By then I was in my forties, I think. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, it's, it's doomsday here. And then I read that and I thought, okay, it's not. And Michael, I think this is what should be taught in schools. This should yes. be headline news. I mean, my yes. God, the one thing that people have wanted from time immemorial is to be happy. And we now science cracked the happiness code. We know how to do it. Yes. It's 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 interesting that we don't learn, people don't learn, we don't teach that in school. We don't teach no. how to be happy. We don't teach just how to be kind anymore. Right. Uh, we don't teach how to deal, kids don't learn how to deal with their emotions properly, you know, and then we expect them to go out into society, get good, a, get, get A's, graduate the top of their class, and then go out and be successful and to be happy. And as you described, you did all of that and weren't happy. Right. You know, uh, it's, 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 it's interesting how our society is uh, in certain areas is advanced, but in so many areas lagging uh, be behind where we could be as a species. Absolutely. It's, yeah. it's the wisdom uh, that we're lacking. We're lacking wisdom. We have a lot of knowledge. We don't have a lot of wisdom that we are following. It's there. You know, right. as you know, it's the all of the of the great teachings of of history of all time. They all point to exactly this. Yes, there's nothing different. It's just now it's time. I think that we're in crisis on the planet, so that we have to pay attention to this. Yes, now. it's an evolutionary trigger for us. Yeah, we both say something very similar. 
<laughs> we both say, um, don't believe everything that you think. <laughs> right. Break, break that down for us in your own way. Yeah. Well, it's just that idea that 80% of our thoughts are negative. And why believe those? Uh, wow. Just because you have a thought. And by the way, 95% of our thoughts are the same thoughts that we had yesterday and the day before. Our minds are just habit machines. Yes. And uh, you just, um, we just have listened to lies about ourselves from mm -hmm. the time that we were very young. And as long as we continue to listen to the lies about how we're not good enough, how we're not okay, all of that, we just believe them. I, I, I will share a little story. I recently was listening to a, um, a woman on TV telling about how she had been trained by a certain uh, former president politician who's, mm -hmm. uh, who's, who's in a lot of trouble right now. <laughs> and, uh, and how she, he taught her, he said, well, just tell them this. And, and she said, well, it's not true. He said, it doesn't matter. You tell people things enough times, they'll believe it. And that is definitely his strategy. That's what he that's said. That's right. Yeah. But that's what our minds have done. They've hijacked us. Yes. Only because we are believing the lies that we learned when we were very young, the conclusions we came to, they're just not true. Yeah. One of the things that I, that I teach is that a lie believed acts as our law until neutralized. Mm. And this, this is what you're describing. We believe these lies and they, they become a part of our very personal law and we can run really fast and we can work really hard and we can do all these things. But until that lie is neutralized, that's our personal law. Yes. We can't go beyond the set point of the law that we are expressing by the lie that we're, we've embodied. So, yeah. And Don't it's so it's really important, I think, to have people around us to surround ourselves. I mean, yeah. your amazing agape community to surround ourselves with people who aren't believing those old lies. Yes. Who are believing the, the, a different truth, because that's how we get uh, we get supported. We support each other in that. It's a whole yeah. lot easier when you got people around you believing, uh, not believing those lies. Yeah, and that's one of, that's one of your seven uh, steps yes. to surround yourself with people that are, I, I call them high vibe people. Yeah. yeah. A possibility thinking people, the supportive people, uh, holy companies, what we, we used to be called in the, in the mystical tradition, surround yourself with, with holy company, not religious company necessarily, yes. but holy company. Um, one of the things I say frequently is that authentic spiritual community grants you immunity from the lower frequencies of life mm. so you, you you end up in a higher vibration and through osmosis your set point rises you it, know it so does you know people ask me well, what do i do around to be around negative people and the first thing i say is build <laughs> your own emotional immune system if, right. if you're around people who have a cold what do you do to not get the cold you build your own physical immune system, same with negative people, build your own emotional immune system, and it'll be like water off a duck's back. I, I had the opportunity uh, of a few times of getting to be with His Holiness, the Dalai Lama. Yeah, yeah. And I remember one time we were in a small group, there were maybe 20 of us in the room, and there was one guy that was really negative. This was before His Holiness came in. And I'm thinking, oh, <laughs> how's this gonna go over? Right. You know? and uh, the Dalai Lama walks in and sits down and his vibe is so high yeah. that the other guy just, the, the negative guy just completely shifted. Yeah. And you know, the, the, the stronger energy wins. That's right. The high vibe wins. I, I've been with him a few times myself. I remember we had uh, something in Dharamsala at his home mm. and we brought together all of these scientists and authors and everybody was vying. The Dalai Lama hadn't come into the room yet. Right. Everybody was fighting to, to see who was going to speak to him first. I've got this idea. The ego was running rampant. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I, hadn't, I, I, had, I was so uh, surprised at these people that I knew were acting this way. And uh, so he walks in the room and... He picks up an instrument. He starts playing like a child. He starts playing this instrument. He's smiling. And then he sits down. And as soon as he sat down, everybody's vibe changed. They became like little kids. They, their ego kind of disappeared. 
and they became wrapped uh, with attention. It was, yes. it was like it was something powerful. And then another time we were having lunch and he was sitting right across from me and somebody came and whispered something in his ear. And they told him that one of his disciples had been uh, tortured um, in China and died. And you could see this energy of sadness roll through him. Then he lifted back up and came back to this wide space of gratitude and compassion. It was like, he didn't deny the sadness. Sadness, nice. like it just came through. He could tell he was sad. And then he bubbled up in, in a matter of a moment, mm -hmm. you know, that as we were talking about earlier, his, his backdrop was joy and compassion. And, but this, you can see where the sadness caught him. And then he bubbled back up. It was, it was an amazing thing to watch. And what's so beautiful about that is to allow the waves to yeah. let it be and that it's okay rather than push it away and Absolutely. just be with it. I'll tell you a story. The night before we were, uh, Association of Global Thought was putting this event on with him. Yeah. And the night before I had this dream. And in this dream, uh, he had walked in the room and somebody asked him a question. And he started saying, well, the, Buddha, the Buddhist treatise on that says X, Y, and Z. And in the dream, I stood up and said, we don't want to hear that. We don't want to hear what the Buddhist treatise said. We want to know your direct experience. And I woke up sweating. I said, oh, my God, I'm, I'm not going to. I just, I said, I'm not going to say that to the Dalai Lama, you know. <laughs> so the next day, the meeting starts just, that, just like in my dream. He walks in. We go through the formalities and we people start asking questions. And just like my dream, this person asked this question and I'm saying, oh no. And the Dalai Lama says, well, according to the Buddhist treaties, blah, blah, blah. He says, but I don't want to stop there. I want to tell you my direct awareness of it. And I said, shoot. <laughs> <laughs> and then he went on to talk about his own direct encounter with the truth. Yeah, he didn't yeah. start quoting scripture. You know, he, uh, he's, he, uh, I'll always remember that because I was like, oh, no, I am not going to say that to the Dalai Lama. <laughs> <laughs> don't quote scripture. Tell me about you. <laughs> I don't know, Michael. I think you would have done a great job being yourself and represent, and he would have loved that. Yeah, but I'm glad I didn't do it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, let's segue a little bit with two things. What are some of the myths that people have about why they can't be happy uh, and then there's also a role that the body plays in it yeah. yeah so the myths of happiness are i'll be happy when yeah that's a good and one. its cousin um more is better i'll be happy you know when i have more so it's I'll be happy when this happens or that happens and then more is better and, right. and those are just we we've, we've dispelled those and there are some really great little hacks yeah, I know you know a bunch of them. I want to, but that has really helped me hugely. The the simple things that you can do to create enough serotonin, you know, certain herbs that you can take, certain yes. uh, neurotransmitters, certain amino acids. But yes. there's one exercise that I learned from a Qinitsang master. Mm -hmm. Qinitsang is a version of Qigong. It focuses on the stomach, and his name is Gilles Marin, and mm -hmm. it takes two minutes to do. And if you do it a couple times a day for a week, it will totally turn around your serotonin. So if anyone is feeling depressed, um, I mean, if it's clinical, please see a doctor. But if it's just, eh, I'm a little down, try this exercise. It's called a sunning meditation. Mm -hmm. And all you do is you go out and in the sun, and I'll tell you what to do if there's no sun where you are. You go out in the sun and you face it with your eyes closed. Really important, close your eyes, face the sun, allow the sun's warmth and light beams to come in through your closed eyelids. Imagine it going into the middle of your head, the pineal gland, mm -hmm. and lighting up the pineal gland. Mm -hmm. And then imagine it just going down through your body. Two minutes of that, twice a day, will shift your serotonin, which in turn will shift your melatonin, Mm -hmm. And your melatonin will help you sleep better. Mm -hmm. Better sleep will help you feel happier. 
-hmm. So it's just this cycle of, I feel better from the serotonin, I sleep better, I feel better from the sleep. So it's this wonderful cycle that really works. And I just tell people, don't take my word for it. Use your life as an experiment and just try it out a couple times a day, two minutes each time for a week and see what happens. Now, if you're not somewhere where there is sunlight, Mm -hmm. then just look at nature. So Mm. if you have a beautiful tree outside or some flowers, nature will also help help produce that for you. Yeah, I, I, yeah, that, that's beautiful because I kind of do that naturally when I go out in the morning and just face the sun and I and I breathe. And so basically, the serotonin you're getting vitamin D, mm-hmm. you know, which is a, 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 which which basically balances your mood and 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 um, uh, basically amplifies your immune system. The serotonin, the melatonin, that's powerful. Two minutes a day, everybody got you got that. Try that. The sunning meditation, mm-hmm. two minutes a day. I like, I like, that's a beautiful exercise. And you know what I found, as I'm sure you have, people were busy. <laughs> we're all yeah. busy. Who's got hours a day to devote to long practices? What we want to do is fit simple practices into our life that become our habits. Yes. So it's just, okay, a couple minutes twice a day. No problem. I got that. Yes. And then that can create a level of momentum that will allow you to extend other practices. You start off with something small. Exactly. But you do it really well until it becomes a habit. And then you find that you have spacious enough within yourself to extend your practice in other areas. Yes. And and to that end, if if you had to ask me besides gratitude, what's the what's the other thing that's kind of the key? It's mm-hmm. it's meditation. It's yeah. connecting to your soul. It's feeling that energy of the of the of who you are you're the truth of who you are yeah there's not one guest that i've had on here that doesn't mention the word meditation yeah that's like that's like the fundamental piece that's now um you know if you go back 30 years ago it was woo woo you know what i mean Uh, i know i i went i went to a college in 1970s where everyone meditated yeah where'd you go huh Which, which one did you go we went to, I went to Maharishi International yes, University. Maharishi, yeah. 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 That was I a part of the it. curriculum. Yeah. yeah. So we met it, but we were definitely the weirdos back then. Yeah. That was, that was weird, man. Yeah. Uh, people, I, I used to say people would rather get caught. I mean, you put a um, paper bag over your book. People would rather get caught reading porn than a book on meditation. Right. Or some spiritual occult thing. <laughs> right. Right. What you reading? Meditation. Oh, you're one of those nuts. One of those crazy. I bet you don't. <laughs> bet you only eat vegetables. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. I, I, let, Michael, let me read a little um, two sentences Go right ahead. of happy for no reason on the pillar of the soul because it's your from your story. Your story okay. was amazing. And I just was looking at it before I came on today. Oh, wow. And, um, and it talks about the reason for meditation is to, to connect in with presence, with the truth of who we are. Right. And this is your last paragraph. It says, the presence is not going to let me down because I am here representing it. When I surrender to the presence, it always works out. Like each one of us, I've been hired by the universe to mm. be myself yes and we're never unemployed because mm-hmm. we've been hired by the universe to be who we really are meant to be yeah now, how do um what do you tell people you know this is onslaught of negativity on the media we talk yeah. about we have a, a bias for negativity but a lot of it is thro- thrust upon us on a daily basis and people are caught in the frequency of fear yeah you know fear anxiousness about the future what do you share with people to to pull them out of that oh well first of all be aware of what you are taking in yeah you know what you're taking in is your the news that you're watching is every bit as impactful on your body as the as the chocolate ice cream that you're eating Mm -hmm. uh or even more so so i don't tend to watch the news i read a few headlines so i know what's going on but i don't sit and and get mesmerized by the news because what happens is we become addicted yeah. to those chemicals <laughs> yes. that make us feel the the cortisol we're addicted right. to it That's so right. we sit in front of the news and we go oh my god i right. want to hear more i want to hear more i gotta hear more right. 
don't don't go to that addiction and especially not before you go to sleep no and when you first wake up either and when you first wake up exactly yeah. so yeah. it's really important what what it is your we, we, we want to know what's going on in the world but only to the degree that we can then put our attention on how to how to contribute to the solutions right now what do you tell how do you tell people that rooting and going deep for your own happiness is not selfish yeah great question people often think you know i'm being selfish I, i'm being selfish to be happy it's mm -hmm. the least selfish thing you can do yes. there is emotional contagion the oh, research yes. shows that we yes. we our happiness affects people at least five people out so your being happier is affecting your neighbors cousins sons school teacher Mm -hmm. So it's it's really what what vibration are you contributing to this planet of ours? There's a beautiful Chinese proverb that says, when there is light in the soul, there will be beauty in the person. Mm -hmm. When there's beauty in the person, there will be harmony in the house. Mm -hmm. When there's harmony in the house, there will be order in the nation. And when there's order in the nation, there will be peace in the world. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, my prayer and my wish is that everyone feel the light, know the light in their own souls. And through that, that we all contribute to peace here on this planet of ours. The cosmic butterfly effect. That's, oh, I love that. That's right. You affect everything. With yeah. your own vibration, your own frequency, because we're all interconnected. Yeah. We're not, we're, the, 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 the viewpoint of separation is a lie, another lie. We're not separate. We're, we're emanating from one source. So we're affecting everything. This is what you're saying. Yeah. And you know, Michael, the, what I've seen about happiness is that there, obviously there are levels of it. Mm -hmm. And about 10 years ago, I started waking up every morning and, and feeling like, oh my God, my life is miraculous. Yeah. You know, just amazing thing. I didn't know what would happen during the day, but magic was happening. The right people were showing up, the cool things were yeah. happening. Yeah. And I realized just like there are ways to get to become happier, there are ways to live in what I've come to call the miracle zone. Oh, that was my next question. Break oh. down the miracle zone. What is it? Uh, I know, obviously, because I've been a part of your program, you know, so what, what is the miracle zone? Yeah, what is you have been a fabulously brilliant and wonderful part of our program. Um, so the miracles, miracles, first, let's define a miracle. Right. A miracle is a surprise and welcome event that can't be explained by science, that's often attributed to divine grace. Yes. So we can't create a miracle. What we can do is we can step into, the, we can create the conditions yes. for miracles to flow in our life. Yes. And that's what I call the miracle zone. It's I'm in that zone and we all know the feeling. It's when you think about somebody and they call you or you, you, you need $973 to pay something and a check for $973 and shows up that day. It's that, it's, it's just life is in the flow. Yeah. And that's, uh, that's thrilling. You know, athletes talk about it, of course, being in the zone, but we all can live in the zone. And that's, that's where you live, Michael. That's why it's, why it's so great to be in your presence. You live in the zone. Yeah, the miracle zone. Now, uh, how can people get in touch with you? And is there anything else you want to say about this, this, this miracle zone and how people can be a part of that? Sure. I do a year-long program, as you know, called Your Year of Miracles. And we focus on living a miraculous life in, in uh, each month in a different area. So one month it's, it's about self-love and one month it's about uh, living your passion and another month it's about uh, miraculous health and mm -hmm. and uh, people can reach me by going to your year of miracles.com or you can also go to happy for no reason dot com uh, mm -hmm. for my work on happiness outstanding and one last question and I think you probably answer this in so many different ways you know the, the, the title of the podcast is take back your mind you know so what is your go-to to take back your mind when it's gotten mm. caught up and curated by the world my go-to is to go to my heart mm -hmm. yeah i think um you know the mind is meant to be the servant of the heart not the other way around the mind is a wonderful agent of 
of of action you know oh i'm i but the heart is the is the guidance the heart the soul the heart is the doorway to the mm-hmm. soul and mm-hmm. it's the guidance about what what is it that i'm here to do mm-hmm. what is it that opens my heart if we follow what opens our hearts Mm-hmm. That's the best guidance on the planet. And then our minds can follow that instruction. Outstanding. Well, you brought a lot of material. And uh, tell us once again where they can find you. And Marcy Sh- Shymoff. Not shy. Not shy. That's how I <laughs> on, used to. T- on fire for happiness. <laughs> <laughs> So I would be delighted to uh, connect with people at happyfornoreason.com or youryearofmiracles.com. And I just want to thank you, Michael, for being a stand on this planet for for true happiness, authentic and lasting happiness, and for Mm. truly living a miraculous life, Mm. because you inspire me always in that. Thank you so much. Back at you. And your compadres that work with you as well, all friends of mine, and uh, life is good. Any any final words, anything that we, that you just figured, you know, I wish I would have said that. I love the final words you just went. Life is good. Life is magnificent. Life is, ma- life is miraculous and magnificent. To the extreme. <laughs> to the extreme. All right. I'll, I'll end on, we can end on that. We'll end on that one. <laughs> Peace and blessings, Marcy. Thank you for Love being. to you, Michael. Thank you. Thank you. God bless you. Obviously, this is our moment for meditation. And if you have been following the Take Back Your Mind podcast, you may be noticing a trend. Almost every single guest that I've had has mentioned the word meditation as a part of their practice. It's fundamental. It is difficult to actually disrupt your present way of thinking without the practice of meditation. Meditation provides the context for you to transcend the content of your mind so that you can take back your mind from a repository of worry and anxiety, interpretation of past experiences, and to be an avenue of expanded awareness of that which is real. You can wake up to be your authentic, real self. So as you've heard my guests say, including Marcy just a few moments ago, in order to have that kind of happiness that uh, she called it a set point. I've called it a set point too for many years. Meditation is key. Meditation is paying undistractable attention to reality. That's capital R reality, not your experience of reality, but that which is real, that which is eternal. Love, beauty, harmony, peace. Those are real qualities that are intrinsic to us as spiritual beings having a human incarnation. Let's stop what we're doing right now. Let's close the outer eyes. Today, let's tap between the space between our eyebrows. Just tap with an intention to wake up and see, not with our eyes, but to see with our expanded awareness the beauty and the love that we're surrounded by. We have our hands now in our lap facing upward as a sign of receptivity. Receptivity is a great tea to drink. Availability is a great tea to drink. The greatest ability is availability. Available to the energy of the source of all creation. Turn within. Allow ourselves to be still. Still. There's no plans for the future right now. There's no hauling the past into present moment. We're right here, right now, with an intention to wake up to our glorious nature. aware that the body is breathing, it's breathing in present moment, not future moment, not past moment. The body temple is breathing in present moment, so presently we're available 
to our intention and the breath. And here we sit. You're aware that the body's breathing. You're aware of the breath. You're aware of your intention. Everything else, you are observing it and are becoming aware of it without interference. Sounds, sensations of the body, emotions that may arise, thought forms. All of that is in your field of awareness and you're just observing it with intention to wake up. this consciousness of total observation, we give thanks that we exist. We give thanks that we are alive, that we are aware. And in this consciousness of thanksgiving, we become the ripe condition for the miraculous to take over our life. We let it be. And so it is. So be it. Slowly open their eyes. And in the here and now, be grateful. The main sponsor of the podcast, that's the Agape International Spiritual Center. How you support the podcast? You support the sponsor, Agape International Spiritual Center. AgapeLive.com or go to Agape International's Facebook page. And if you feel inclined, you feel generous, make a donation to Agape and just say, in honor of the podcast, take back your mind. If you want to support our other sponsor, that is Adapto Zen. That's the creator of my superfood greens. 47 plant-based ingredients. Energy, digestion, and immunity in a scoop. <laughs> Go to Nutrarise.com. Get the bundle, the vitamin D3, K2, and the superfood greens. You'll be supporting your body temple, and you'll be assisting and sponsoring this podcast. Have a bright and beautiful day. You deserve it, so you might as well receive it. Peace and blessings. Your time is very valuable, so I want to thank you for lending us your ear and participating in taking back your mind. If you want to submit a question for the question of the week, please submit it to podcast at michaelbeckwith.com. If you've enjoyed what you've heard today, please submit a review and let us know your thoughts. Stay on top of current episodes by subscribing to the podcast so that you'll receive alerts and not miss one single episode. And feel free to share this podcast with all of your friends and family. And until we meet again, take back your mind and you will take back your life. Peace and blessings.